today. She's got a beautiful voice with a beautiful church behind her. Right? Yeah. I'll see you later. How's everybody doing this morning, all right? Good to see everybody. As the guys had a great time golfing yesterday. We all won. <laughs> we all played awesome. It's fellowship and together. I don't know if it was better than golf with the food after. <laughs> it was delicious. It was great. All right, we're going to start in Psalms 103 this morning. And we are continuing to uh, rebuild God's house and make it look better as we got the garbage disposal finally working again. We get to spick it outside so it doesn't leak. Amen. The guardrail is in so you don't, your car will show up in my body shop. <laughs> you got stairs with a railing so you don't fall down them. Right? Things are things are going along. So please continue to support it. We still have a long, long way to go. We need to install spotlights outside the church. Exercise in the building. We've got a long way to go, so please continue to support the building fund. You see what it's doing, you know where it's going, so please continue to support it. We're grateful for each and every one that does. Just do your best. Do your best. All right, Psalm 103, the Holy Spirit will be taken over this morning as I go into these scriptures, so please prepare your minds and hearts to receive the message that the Spirit is trying to say to the church this morning. Amen? Amen. As always, the devil will try to distract you. We're in Psalms 103. We're going to back up to verse 1. This is an awesome psalm right here. Psalm of David. Psalm 103. We do have a blue card inside the pew. If you need help getting to the scriptures, because we will be moving along the scriptures this morning, as we always do. Psalm 103. Look at verse 1. Psalm of David. Let all that I am Praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise His holy name. So God is calling us to give all of us to Him, His our whole heart. And do we do that right away? No. It's a process for the time we decide to give Him all of our heart. Amen? It's a process. He knows. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. When you're going through trials, and you get unanswered prayers, just remember, never forget the good things He's already done for us. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. We, always, we seem to always forget the good and always remember what's going on with that. And that's just what the devil wants. Jesus always looked for the good in everybody. He looked past the fall to see the need, just like Christians are supposed to be. Amen? And that's why we have to grow up. Because we always seem to see what's wrong with people more than what's right with them. Amen? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is. And the spirit, everybody's good. We get along with each other. Nobody's doing anything. We're not talking about each other. We love one another. In the flesh, we're gossiping. We're slandering. We're lusting after things. We're selfish and self-centered still. Can that still happen to a believer? Absolutely. It's a choice we have to make every day to deny ourselves for the benefit of others. That's what love does. Now look at verse 3. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. So the Lord crowns us all with His love and His tender mercies. So He wants us to what? Instill that in ourselves and instill that in others too. Amen. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. I was going to say you. <laughs> So let me just keep going and say you. Say good. Yeah. Yeah, every time that movie comes on, I just happen to watch my cousin Vinny all the time. I don't know what it is. Something that draws me to that movie is just funny. My youth is renowned like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. So listen, we don't take justice into our own hands when we're treated unfairly. We put it in the hands of the Lord. And we leave it in his hands. Like any man here. Then we're going to steal our peace. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Here's our Lord. Verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Our God is compassionate, merciful, and very slow to get angry. 
with unfit, filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. What a big amen right there, huh? He has removed our sins as far as from the east and from the west. All right, so we've removed them. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. What's wrong with America today? They have no fear of God. They're just doing what they want to do in their own sight, knowing that this country was built on the Bible and godly principles. That's what it was built on. That's why you see a church on every corner in America. Because it was built according to God's ways. And that is why God blessed America. Because we did things His way. Now, no, we don't want to do things God's way anymore. We want to do things our own way. We, do, we see do what's right in our own sight. And we think that maybe America's not going to get judged. Well, you know what's going to happen. When people go, go their own way, we end up making a mess and falling apart. Can I get an amen here? Now he says, from verse 14, For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wild flowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we are born as though we had ne never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear Him. His salvation extends to the children's children of all those who are faithful to His covenant and of all of those who obey His commandments. The Lord has made heavens His throne. From there He rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out His plans, listening for each of His commands. Yes, Praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve Him and do His will. Praise the Lord, everything He has created, everything in all His kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. What a beautiful song that was, wasn't it? This is unbelievable. All right, we're going to continue our look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. I want us to turn to Romans chapter 12 this morning. And I am going to give us some homework, and I want us to read Romans 12 when you're not here. We're going to go over it again next week. But Romans 12, explain God's ways to us and what we should be doing as believers. Okay. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. As a matter of fact, Go to um, verse 1. A living sacrifice to God. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. That's not a requirement. He's just asking, He's pleading you to give your bodies to God. Why? Because all that he has done for us, okay? Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The true way to worship God is living for him and his ways. Can I get an amen? That's what it says. Don't copy, now look what it says in verse 2. Pay attention to what it's saying here. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by sapping you with his Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, that's not in there, is it? No. How is he going to do this? Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Now, then it says, then you will learn to know God's will for you. So we have to learn what God's will is for us. And the only way we're going to do that is by the Bible. It says, Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Very humbly right there, isn't it? Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. I want to be an amen there. We all belong to each other right here. In the spirit, all of us get along. We love one another. We're not judging one another. We care about each other. We pray for each other. We lift each other up. In the flesh, do you hear what so-and-so did? Do you know what they're doing over there? Did you see what's wrong today? Did you see that crack in the wall? It's always cold in here. Oh, oh. There's no pocket. That's the flesh. In the spirit, we make provision. Okay? We're grateful that we have a church. We're grateful that we have people in the church. We're grateful that the church is getting fixed. We're grateful that the Holy Spirit is in us. We're grateful that we're going home to be with Him. And we're thankful. Can I get an amen here? That's the way we're supposed to come to church. With an open heart and a renewed mind. Instead of what? Murmuring and complaining. That's the flesh. You can come to church in the flesh and you'll never get a message. Because your flesh is not going to get fed here. It's going to get crucified. That's what my job is. Crucify your flesh. All right. And I'm pretty good at it, too. Because, you know, a lot of pastors won't convict the, con the, the, the congregation because they think they'll walk away. If you convict us of sin. Look, we're coming here because we are sinners. Not because we're not. None of us are better than anyone else. We're all in the same boat there. All of us have the same sins inside of us. Lust, hate, transgender, greed, gossip, slander. All of us at any given point can do that. So that's like, who are we to judge anyone else? Thinking that we're better. You always find yourself doing better than the guy next to you. But when you compare yourself to the cross, we all fall far short. We're all in the same boat. I'm going to name that here. So get humble and remain teachable. And don't think you're better than you really are. That's what the Bible tries to tell us. All right. Now, most Christians really don't understand the nature of the Holy Spirit, so we're going to teach on this subject this morning. The reason for that is that either churches never talk about the Holy Spirit, or they teach incorrect things about the Holy Spirit. Okay? Some teach that the Holy Spirit is a feeling, when actually he's more of a teacher, a person that makes us more wise. This series will help us understand what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and what He does in the life of a Christian. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, believers are saved, filled, sealed, and sanctified. The Holy Spirit reveals God's thoughts, teaches, and guides believers into all truth, including knowledge of what is to come. The Holy Spirit also helps Christians in their weakness and intercedes for them. Like the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. You know we don't know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings we can't understand. And He just prays for us. He knows what's in our hearts. Sometimes we can't put it in words. So He does it for us. Amen? Yeah. Holy Spirit's awesome. You want Him by His side. Trust me. If you want to understand who God is, you need to understand all of who God is. Okay? Getting your head around the difference between God the Father and Jesus is one thing. Okay? But many struggle to grasp who the Holy Spirit is in a way they could explain clearly to someone else. Okay? God is one, but three persons. That's not a simple idea to get grips with, to get grips on. When theologians speak of the three in oneness of God, they refer to him as the Trinity. We all know that saying, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right? Understanding who the Holy Spirit is? Okay? The place he holds within the Holy Trinity and the role he plays in individual life is vital, listen now, to anyone exploring what it means to become a Christian, okay, and anyone trying to follow and become like Jesus, the very reasons why he saved us. Knowing the Holy Spirit will radically change your life, okay? People said back in the Old Testament, my people suffer because they don't know me. When you believe in Jesus, you have Him. But after you believe in Him, the, the, the process goes on of getting to know Him. 
And we get to know Him by reading the Bible, by coming to church, by going to Bible study, by fellowshipping with other believers. We can get to know Him by reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to He revealed will to us in His character. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, go change your life. Once we have saved the Lord to God, the Spirit takes up residence in our hearts forever. You are sealed. Sealing us with the confirming, certifying, and assuring pledge of our eternal state as His children. We're sealed and sanctified. Nothing that we did is what Jesus did. I want an amen there. We don't work for salvation, but salvation works. It shows us that we're saved. Yeah, I'm a little difficult to see that because it's warm. I'm blowing a couple of fuses here and there, but we'll be all right. I got the, um, the, the dungeon's open to go right down here and turn it down. That's good. I call it the dungeon. That's what it's like. I don't know if anybody's been down there. It's a little creepy down there. Yes. Not only knows what went on down there, but that's <laughs> <laughs> Alright, don't let it get distracting to you, okay? Stay, pay attention. And we'll come back on again. Okay, certify and share the pledge. Jesus said that he would send the Spirit to us as I help him. Okay, comfort up in God. Okay? And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsel to be with you forever. John 14, 16. I'm just going to run through this quick. The Greek word translated here, counselor, means one who is called alongside... Okay? And as he had given someone who encourages and exalts. The Holy Spirit takes a permanent residence in the hearts of believers, like it tells us in Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and verse chapter 12, verse 13. Jesus gave the Spirit as a compensation for his absence, okay, to perform the function told us that he would have done if he had remained personally with us. How about a big amen there? Amen. All right. Among those functions, okay, is the revealer of truth. Okay? The Spirit's presence within us enables us to understand and interpret God's Word, the ultimate teacher. Jesus told His disciples that when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. John 16, verse 13. Okay? He reveals to our minds the whole counsel of God as it relates to worship, doctrine, and Christian living. Okay? He is the ultimate guide going before, leading the way, removing obstructions, opening the understanding, and making all things plain and clear to us. Okay? He leads in a way that we should go in all spiritual things. He teaches us all spiritual things. Without such a guide, we would be apt to fall into error. A crucial part of the truth he reveals is that Jesus is who he said he is. John 15, 26, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. The Spirit convinces us of Christ's deity and incarnation, his being the Messiah, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension. Okay? His exaltation at the right hand of God and His role as the judge of all. He gives glory to Christ in all things. John 16, 14. So let's take a deep dive into this topic and see how we can transform it today. How's that? Amen. The Holy Spirit gives believers the power to live like Jesus, to be bold witness to Him, of course, there are many ways he goes about doing this. Okay? He works in different ways. So we're going to look at the most common ones. Okay? We're going to take a look. Jesus said in John 16, 7, that it was to our benefit that he would go away so we could receive the Holy Spirit. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. If Jesus said, Okay? It is best for us that he goes away, then it must be because there is something valuable about what the Holy Spirit was coming to do. I didn't mean anything. 
Here is one instance in Acts 1 8 that gives us strong clues. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From this scripture, we can gather the foundational concept of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a Christian. Okay, you with me so far here? He sends us out as witnesses and gives us the power to do it effectively. When we go out and witness, we have our antennas on. We just don't go out in the flesh and try to get people saved. We go out in the spirit looking for an opening to talk about Jesus. And you know, there's not always opportunities to talk about Jesus. But when you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask that, Lord, use me as a vessel to get people to you, he will line something up so you can. Now, either you're going to make a choice and do it and talk about Jesus, or you're not. But don't be, don't be worried about it if you didn't, because God will use someone else to get Jesus to them. But we'll miss out on the opportunity of that great gift and reward of bringing someone into the kingdom. Can I get an amen? There's always opportunities. You're on a mission field every day. That's why it's important to live like what you believe so people can see Jesus in you and be attracted to that. They don't want to see what the world sees every day of people talking about people and gossiping and slandering and arguing all the time. They want to see what? Gentleness, peace, joy, all the fruits of the Spirit working in the believer's life so that becomes an attraction to people who are broken. Can I get an amen here? That's why it's important to live by what you believe. It's easy to be in here and live that way because you know we're sitting here. You know, you got to act a certain way. When you leave here, all the more, you're supposed to use what you're learning to bring others into the kingdom. He saved you for an ultimate purpose. And there's nothing better rewarding than when you can get someone else to come to Jesus. Can I get an amen here? And if you can't talk about Jesus, the next best thing is to act like, act like Jesus. And be courteous and kind and accepting and understanding where people are at. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. There are many ways the Holy Spirit works, but they all share one common goal. To make us more like Jesus Christ. The whole goal of a ministry in a church is to make you, each one of us, like Jesus. And less of ourselves and more like Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. He works in believers by renewing our minds to be like the mind of Christ. And the only way you're going to get the mind of Christ is by reading the Word of Christ. And any man here. It's not rocket science. It doesn't happen by osmosis. We have to learn all over again how to think, how to live, and how to act. Nobody has to teach us how to do wrong. We already know that. It's already in us. We have to be taught how to do things God's way. And that's why He saved us and put His Spirit in us to teach us that. And get any man here. He saved you for a reason, not so you can have a good life down here, so you can bring others into the kingdom. Your best life isn't here. Your best life is with him, in heaven with him. Reasonably happy here, and forever happy with him in the next life to come. Then amen. Unfortunately, Christians don't think they need to read the Bible every day. They don't think they need to read Genesis to Revelation. They can start halfway in the middle of the book. Well, you go buy a book in the bookstore, and you open it up in the middle and read it. And you tell me you can understand the whole plot of the story. No, you buy a book, you open it, and you read it from the beginning to the end. And I get an amen here. It's the same thing with the Bible. You open it up, the Holy Spirit, you pray, say, Lord, reveal yourself to me, and you start reading. And if you have trouble seeing, I graciously read it for you. You go on the website, through the Bible in the year, it comes on. As a matter of fact, I don't know, we're, talking, but we're reaching millions of people with that. Amen. Millions of people are reading the Word of God through this ministry. Amen. I'm hoping the people that are inside the ministry, in His house, are reading it too. Because once you do that, it makes it more effective. Because now we're actually doing what we say we do. We read the Bible, we study the Word of God, and we put it out there. So if you haven't read the Word of God, please, get in it and read it. It will save you, it will change your life. Not as it only a choice, it's a requirement as a Christian 
to know God from the beginning to the end. I get me many here. It's just not taught enough. In this church it is. We're going to know God here. We already have Him. Now we're going to get to know Him. It's like going back to school again. To learn how to live the right way. We already know how to live the wrong way. Take a look at your life now. Take a good look in the mirror. You see that we got issues. Was it just me? Am I the only one with issues in me? Oh, thank you. We can be real again. Take the church face off, okay? We all got issues, okay? You want to know who you really are when you're home, when the doors are closed, when nobody's looking? That's you. And you're bickering and complaining, and, and, and you know what I'm talking about, right? The real you. Well, he's trying to give us integrity. The real you is supposed to be what? Like you are in church, you're you in here, you're on the road, at home, you love someone, you love them like Jesus loves them, you forgive anyone who offends you, you walk by the Spirit's power. And that's the choice you have to make each and every day, and that's why I'm going to teach you the Holy Spirit's role, because now you're going to be without excuse. Say, I can't do it. Because we can do all things through Christ, who strengthens us. And that's the Word of God, which is our strength and our power. Okay? Through repentance, okay? He does this by convicting us of sin and leading us through repentance. Through repentance, okay? He wipes out what was dirty in us and allows us to be a good fruit. Okay? As we allow Him to continue nourishing that fruit, we grow to resemble Jesus more as Galatians 5, 22, 23 informs us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. So in the Spirit you can accomplish all that. And guess what? He's already put it inside each and every one of us. It's in your. It's up to you what you want to operate in. The new heart of the old. That's the war that goes on. You make a choice each and every day. But don't make excuses because God's not going to hear your excuses. He's going to say, I give you my word. I give you the teacher. I give you, and if you're not going to do it, it's on you. Don't blame anyone else. Because you treated me like this, I treated you like that. There's no justification anymore. Can I get an amen? amen? The Holy Spirit, okay, I love it, gives believers the power to live like Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit also works in us with the Word of God. Go with me to Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to really get to know the Holy Spirit in this series. Now that I make the ground where we can get into some of the principles. Amen. You know what the beauty of it is? Everybody's paying attention to I can see it. And then if you're not, it's because you don't want God. When you want God, you want to listen to that. Amen. Amen. Because people said, those who belong to God gladly listen to the words of God. Those who belong to God, listen gladly to the words of God. Those who do not belong to God, do not gladly listen to the words of God. Can I get an amen for this? Amen. So that's how you can evaluate if you belong to God. You want His word. You want to hear His word. You want people to teach you His word. And you want to live like Him. It's a desire He puts in us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and useful. What is it useful for? To teach us. That means we don't know everything. We need to get taught. To teach us what is true. See, because we've been listening to lies all our life. The Bible teaches us what is true. And look what else it does. It's to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Why? Because we always think there's something wrong with other people, never us. It says to make us realize what's wrong in our life. You see, the spiritual mirror of God is saying, take a good look in the mirror. Before you go judging someone else, look in the mirror and judge yourself. And then you say, you know what, I'm not going to judge anybody else because I ain't no better than they are. Can I get an amen here? It, to teach us what is true, it corrects us when we are wrong, so the Bible is corrective. So it doesn't say if we're wrong, it says when we're wrong. 
So we all make many mistakes. And it teaches us to do what is right. Like I said before, you don't have to be taught to do what's wrong. If I let one of them kids out of that room, you think they're going to come kneel and start praying to Jesus? No, they're going to cause destruction. Though. They're going to tear everything apart and go nuts. And does anybody teach them how to do that? No, it's already in it. They have to be taught to be quiet. They get on their knees and pray. Just like we do. How about an amen there? Some reason we think our ways are the right ways. Everybody thinks, well, I'm right and they're wrong. No, no. Only God is right. Believe me. Now what it says, what else does he use it for? God uses it to what? Prepare and to equip his people to do every good work. So do you really think you can go be a witness for God without reading the word of God and growing spiritually? It says he used it to prepare us. We have to get prepared to do that. And the only way you're going to get prepared to do that is being taught the Word of God to teach us what's right and to show us what's wrong in our lives so we can do the works of God. So all of us get things wrong with us. Don't get too proud and think that you're smarter than anybody else. Because let me tell you something. You're not as smart as you think you are in the Spirit. As we build a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit, He will also pull us away from things we have in our lives that don't please Him. Okay? The point is, when He isn't working your life, it's evident all around you. Number one, the first principle, the Holy Spirit makes us more like Christ. Go will be 2 Corinthians chapter 3. First principle. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, am I just making this up? No, I'm going to prove it through the scriptures. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Is everybody with me so far on this? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's important. It's important to know the truth. Because it's the truth that sets you free. Because it says it right here. Look at verse 17. For the Lord, Jesus, is the Spirit. I'll let everybody get that. Of the pages to that. I want you to see. I want you to see where it says what it's supposed to do. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the bondage of sin. Freedom from your sin nature. Freedom from things that are stopping you from pleasing God and doing His will. Now listen. So all of us who've had that veil removed, which is everyone who believes in Jesus, the veil has been removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, again, tells us the Lord who is the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? Makes us more and more like Him, like Jesus, as we are changed into His glorious image. Can I get an amen yet? It's plain, it's right here. We are saved to become like Jesus. Don't let anybody fool you. You're saved for that reason, to become like Jesus. Don't let, whatever you learned before, you never learned it the right way. The right way is, He saved us to become like Jesus. Not to go on living in sin the way you used to live before. You are transformed. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen here? He gives us all the power and everything we need to accomplish that. He does for us what we can't do for ourselves, but He doesn't do for us what we can. Like read His Word. Come to Bible study. Serve Him. Bring others into the kingdom. And get any men here. Alright. We already know the goal of the Holy Spirit's work is to make us more like Jesus. But how does He do it? How does He do this? Is it osmosis? How do we go from that caterpillar into that cocoon and come out a butterfly? That's what happens. You know the process of what? You know the process, right? You go with the caterpillar goes into the cocoon. Does the caterpillar stay a caterpillar? No, he comes out as a butterfly. Now let me ask you this. Can that butterfly decide to go back to be a caterpillar? Yeah. 
No, that letter form just take place in the permanent. So, if you are a believer and you went into the cocoon and came out like Jesus, do you really think you can go back and be the same person you were before? Not a chance. Every time you try, you get convicted to come back. You are transformed forever. You cannot go back into the caterpillar state. If you do, it's because you never had it to begin with. Can I get an amen here? You cannot go back. The butterfly can't become a caterpillar again. Just like the believer can't go back into the unbelief again. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. He'll work on you. Amen. He's worked on me. Every time I want to say no to this, he convicts me to come back. Amen. Just like he does you. You keep coming to church, right? These messages ain't all long, long, fluffy, are they? <laughs> but you want more. Because you know what? It's the truth. It's the truth. You cannot go back. Can you, can you go back and even act like the way you do? Absolutely, but you can't stay there. You have to think you back onto the other side. Man, I gotta do something here. I gotta go to Bible study. I gotta pray. I gotta do something here. My flesh is vicious. <laughs> you start to hate your flesh. Because you don't want that anymore. And then there. Okay. It's a process known as sanctification. Okay, and no, it is not as complicated as it appears. Okay? Sanctification is the process of the Holy Spirit stripping away our sinful habits and bringing us into holiness. Think of it like peeling back an onion. Okay? There are layers. The Holy Spirit works in us by peeling away our sinful characteristics and replacing them with badly characteristics. It's not hard to figure out. His work in us makes us more like Jesus. Now, and if you don't want that, yes, we do. You close your Bible and you stop coming to church. That's what happens. You don't want this. So you say, I'm not coming to church. That's not, I'm not putting Jesus first in my life. I'm not converted. I want, I want my flesh back. Can I get an amen here? Amen. But when you put him first and you make him valuable to you, you never miss. No matter what it is. Because you know you need it. You need it. Nothing comes before Jesus. That's why, back in the Old Testament, how many people made it to the promised land? Not the, not the, all, uh, all the millions of them. Does everybody remember how many? Two. Two people out of millions. Why? He said they had different spirit. They had a wholehearted spirit for me. That's why they went in the promised land. Everybody else did it half-hearted. You want to become like Jesus? You're going to be all in. And that's the process of sanctification. He does it slowly. Over the time of the believer's life, all the way that we go home to be with him. That's what the grace and mercy is for. To make us more like him. And less like ourselves. <laughs> okay, and please make it look, alright, the second principle. The Holy Spirit gives us power to witness to people. Listen, how can you witness to somebody if nothing happened to you? Would you be a false witness that say, I haven't been converted, but I'm going to go try to convert someone else? No, first you have to be converted, right? So you can say, this Jesus changed my life. Yeah. So then when you go to witness to somebody, you really have a purpose. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. Right. You say, something happened to me, so I'm telling you what happened to me. I'm not going to go out and witness if I've never been converted. That's what happens. They throw a bunch of Christians on the bus that haven't been taught the Word of God to go out and try to witness to both Jesus when they don't even know Him yet. First we have to get to know Him and we become a witness for Him. Because He did something in us that we want to share with someone else. And if He didn't do that to you, then you have nothing to witness. Can I get any men here? Amen. It's like being a false witness. I'm going to go out and tell everybody about Jesus, but I'm not like Him. Do you think that has any power? I'm not living like Jesus. How's that going to have any power to bring anybody in? No, first you have to become like him before you can witness to him. Is that rocket science? No. Everybody wants to what? Go out there and teach everybody before they even learn. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. That song, Let My Jesus Change Your Life, first he has to change you. And then he helps to change other people. So don't get the cop before the horse. Now he gives us power. Go to Acts chapter 1.
I want this church, the Wayne Ministries, to be a powerful witness of Jesus Christ living in the believer's life. And the only way that's going to happen is if I teach you correctly how to do that. The truth. Not some empty rituals, but what we need to confer it. So we can help convert others. Can I get an amen here? Okay. That's the role of the church. Do you think I want you to leave the same way you came in? No, I want you to leave more. what? More like Jesus. Get more of him in you. That new heart. You're getting, you're getting, the new heart is getting to beat now. Because you're getting the truth. It's the truth that makes the new heart come out. Unless you want to believe a lie. Tons of them out there. Now look what it says. In Acts 1, 8. Mentions to us, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now Jesus taught them first, before he let them go out and witness. Now the Holy Spirit empowers Christians, listen now, to be effective witnesses to Jesus Christ. He gives us the boldness to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ in situations when we would normally be fearful or timid. Now, go and read 2 Timothy chapter 1. Listen, when you're led by the Spirit, you're bold as a lion. Bold as a lion. No fear. No doubt. No worry. You're putting your trust in God. So he's going to get it. He's going to give you the right words. To say. A lot of times we get fearful, right? We don't want to talk about Jesus. We say we might screw it up. Not if you're led by the Spirit, you'll never will. You'll never screw it up. Because the Holy Spirit will be the one using you. Yes. First you have to know the difference. See, if you don't know the difference between the Holy Spirit and your flesh, you're not going to have to know who's operating. You have to know yourself first, what your flesh is like. And then you have to know the Spirit, which is the Bible. But you have to learn, you have to know both. Most people don't want to look in the mirror to know themselves because they're afraid of what they're going to see. So you look in the mirror and say, look, I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Transform me into the person you want me to be so I can help save others. First, you have to admit you're a sinner before you need a Savior. Don't, if that makes sense? If we need a Savior, we have to admit that we're sinners, right? Thank you. Okay. You have, that, that has to be the first thing. You have to admit. Now it says, the Holy Spirit of powers. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. We have to close. Verse 7. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 encourages us. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, fear, it says the spirit of fear. Do you understand what these are? These are not emotions. They're spirits. This is what people have a hard time understanding. It says he's not giving us a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Right? A spirit of timidity. Timidity is the spirit. But of power. Spirit. The power is through the spirit. Love is the spirit. Love is not some warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is a spirit. Spirit of love. And a spirit of what? Self-discipline or self-control. This is something that Christians don't have. Self-control is not willpower. See, our flesh, when we do something in willpower, we still want to do it, but we don't do it. When you do something with self-control, you don't, you, God changes your desire. You can put it in front of you until you're blue in the face and you don't desire it anymore. That's what self-control is. The more control you give over to God, the more self-control it gives you. Willpower doesn't work. You end up doing it sneaky. Say, I'm going to give something up, right? And you tell everybody, I'm giving up, say, coffee. I'm not going to drink coffee anymore, right? But I still want to. Okay? I want to drink that coffee. So eventually, because I can't want to do it, my flesh wants to do it, the devil is going to keep tempting me. You need coffee, you're tired. Yeah, but I told everybody I wasn't. <laughs> I don't drink coffee anymore. <laughs> Got it? You become a sneak.
sneaky sinner. Now, when you're a sneaky sinner, it's even worse for you. Now you get convicted even more. Because now you're telling somebody you're not doing something, you're lying and doing it. Wouldn't it be better to say, you know what? That corpse made me too jittery. I can't witness. So what am I going to have to give up? Lord, please give me the self-control I need to not want that anymore. And then when the day comes when you don't want it anymore, then you just don't want it. So you said, hey, you need a, want a coffee? No, thank you. I don't try it anymore. See the difference? But when you have willpower, when you do willpower, somebody says, hey, have a cup of coffee. No, I can't drink coffee. Coffee's evil. <laughs> I can't drink coffee and what's evil? Coffee's not evil. We are. There's nothing wrong with having a cup of coffee. What's wrong with it is if you drink 20 of them. Because then you get too much caffeine in it. See, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the coffee. It's wrong with something with us. But the Holy Spirit puts a governor in our hearts to control it. That's what self-control is all about. Some things we can't touch again because we have no self-control over it. And some things we can, like food, right? You can't say, well, I'm not going to eat anymore. <laughs> You just can't eat as much as you're used to anymore. So you need self-control in that area. So you ask God to give you self-control to just want one sandwich, not three. And you're not eating, you're not, you're not living to eat, you're eating to live. You see? You make food your God, but that makes you feel better. Instead of eating to live because you need nourishment to, so you can keep going. Get what I'm saying? It changes you. That's what self-control is all about. It's nothing to do with willpower. Willpower fails you all the time. Like I said before, you tell some girl, I don't need to have the sandwich today. <laughs> and you go, behind well, I need to be warm. <laughs> Get it. <laughs> Everybody does the same thing. We're all sneaky. We're all sneaky sinners. But that makes you miserable, Christian. That's why when I see miserable Christians, that's what I know that they're doing. Because a, a, a miserable Christian is telling people they're living a Christian life but they're living in the flesh. Because when you're living in the flesh, you're miserable as a Christian. Because the Christianity doesn't appeal to your flesh. It kills it. So if you're miserable, it's because you still want your flesh and it's trying to kill it. But when you're joyful as a Christian, you want to kill your flesh and you want to be in the Spirit. So when you come to church, you're full of joy. So I'm finally getting rid of this flesh that I hate. I'm not doing the things I love anymore. I'm doing the things I hate. It's the conversion that goes on. Ain't any men here. So that's the last, that's the last scripture. But God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self discipline Now we understand what a spirit is. First, we have to understand what these spirits are so we can understand how they work. Ain't any men. So when, he, when, it goes, when you go up to witness and fear comes over you, did you know that that's not of God? That spirit that's coming into you. It's not of God. It's from the devil stopping you from witnessing. Amen. Then you say, even though I'm fearful, God's giving me the courage to go beyond that. I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to follow that fear. I'm going to follow my faith. Get it? Amen. That's what you have to be taught. But when you still follow your fear, then you don't keep your mouth shut. And then you lose out on telling somebody about Jesus. Then you feel bad later and say, I had a chance to talk about Jesus and I did. Yeah. Later on, you feel convicted over that. You know. You know you have the opportunity, but you, your fear took over you and paralyzed you from doing it. If I was to let fear paralyze me, I'd never be able to come up here. Every time they come up there, fear tries to grip me. But I'm doing something like that. Yeah. Jesus takes over. And that's how it works. All right, we're not going to close there. Maybe before we share that, we'll pick up more principles when we get back together. I'm going to call the ushers to come up and take up the collections.